Well, hello again and welcome to Vanch Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. Thank you for tuning in. Beautiful out there today. It's going to be like 55 degrees. Jenny and I are taking a walk. Radio said maybe even up to 60 and it's supposed to be pretty nice for the whole Thanksgiving weekend. That would be good because I let... Thanksgiving weekend's one of those weekends that if it turns out to be crappy weather, it throws my whole holiday thing off because if Dan and I don't get Christmas lights up this weekend, I feel like we're not going to do it. I feel like that is an undue amount of pressure it that is. you are well, placing no, on yourself it's for really things not, that are supposed it's to be not, fun. But it's just like when I used to have a swimming pool and I used to tell myself, you must close the pool at the end of Labor Day weekend. And then I wouldn't because it'd be sneaky warm. Yeah, it's never warm enough to swim after Labor Day weekend. <laughs> it's barely warm enough to swim most of the And so all of a sudden, of of a sudden the, the leaves would be in the pool and I'd be like, damn it. I'm supposed to close the pool on Labor Day weekend. I'm supposed to put up Christmas lights on Christmas. Not big. Um, I mean, right. it takes us all of an, you know, an hour. So it was a busy week here in the Granite States. It's so a busy many week. things um, that happened. Yes. Um, so, so right to know. Yeah, so right to know. Uh, three cases were up in the Supreme Court last Wednesday, I believe. It was Wednesday because I was at work. Um, I went up to just sort of observe and and you know get a sense. So in in a the shortest version would be there were these three cases. It's in front of the New Hampshire Supreme Court. There were four Supreme Court justices. There's one open position. Okay. Which we know because uh, Governor Sununu had tried to appoint uh, McDonald, yes. who's currently the head of the AG's office um, and the executive council actually turned it down yep. in a 3 2 vote, yep, yep. Uh, according to party lines. Um, since McDonald's actually the, the AG who wants to, um, uh, you know, keep the lawyers' yeah. list secret, which is the only way you can interpret the fact that they uh, decided to appeal the yep. lower court decision from April, where Judge Temple said, Oh, yeah, we should totally make this list you know, public because a list of bad cops is probably something that the public needs to know right. and should be in the public interest. So uh, so off we went to the court last Wednesday. Uh, this was not the Lori's List case. So these were three separate cases. Uh, in a nutshell, basically, the first one was about the Salem Police Department, yeah. where they had a audit of the department yeah. because th it was so shady over there yeah. that they actually had to call in a third party, yeah. do an audit report, came out with the report. I believe the police chief actually had to quit yep, as I a result. The chief and then um, there was this audit report that came out, and it was very, very, very heavily redacted, so much so that you couldn't really tell anything that right. was going on. Uh, so that was the one case. The other case was about the policeman who, also from the free coast area, the sea coast area, I don't know what's in your water over there, guys. Actually, I do know. <laughs> <laughs> Pollution from Pease Air Force Base, but okay. <laughs> um, so in this one, it was the policeman who had uh, done the undue influence of his neighbor where he befriended this el elderly millionaire lady. Oh, and lady he took, care, took advantage of her. And yes, took, got took it. advantage of her. She left her estate worth several millions of dollars to him. Everyone was like, That's that a seems little... a little sketchy. Maybe we should look into yeah. this. So what happened was when he was l uh, let go from his department because they were like, yeah, this doesn't you know, <laughs> seem that ethical. Um, they ended up doing a settlement in arbitration with him. And then he was paid money to leave is how I understand the right. facts it's of this because case. Because it's probably easier. So in that case, the arbitration award was made secret, fully redacted, so mm. no one can know how much did you have to pay to get rid of this the... This sketchy cop. Yes. And then the third case was, and this is my favorite one, I because know. it just shows everyone everything that we need to know about whether we have a right to know, was the Keene State student. Yes. So this is a uh, professor yeah. who... Uh, you know, as part of her sort of school project, part of her class project was like, we're going to file 91 A's and uh, we're going to see the response and you're going to see, you know, brave citizens and young journalists of the future, how awesome our right to know laws are and how open and transparent and responsive and accountable government is to you. Oops. Oops. So, um... In that case, uh, Greg Sullivan, who's the attorney for the union leader mm -hmm. and is a big 1A First Amendment attorney, really smart guy. Uh, I, I 
uh, admire him a lot. Uh, in that case, he actually talked about um, it's the egregious violations of right to know. So these five students filed five separate right yep. to know requests according to things that students would find interesting. One was like a, a use of force for police departments. One was underage drinking. I mean, just kind just of stuff. things that like college students would be interested yeah. in, like how many, you know, underage kids do you arrest? Right. You know, what, like, you know, just, just stuff. stuff, right? They did not get one, not one piece of information from the Keene uh, Police Department or the Keene Town of Keene, where uh, they just basically, they were like, no, this sounds like you're asking us to compile a list. Yeah, we don't do that. Screw you. Off oh, you go. You. So those were the three cases that were heard. Uh, the Lori's List case, I believe, will be heard in late December. Okay. Interesting choice of time. Um, you know, maybe people will be gone for holidays and right. stuff, so they're maybe trying to keep it on, on the low down. But basically what happened last Wednesday is they said... Of course, the court's going to take all of this right. under advisement. Uh, we should get a decision in the next three to six months, would be my guess. But really, most of the law around it surrounded Fenneman. Mm -hmm. So this is a case yes. from 1993. So in the Fenneman case, which was wrongly decided, and I think even the justices See really that. have a sense that Ooh, we might have right. we might have screwed up here because they um, the Fenneman case basically said that personnel records are uh, exempt from from, from the 91A and so we know that this has created sort of an opportunity for people to hide malfeasance within their personnel records and really you know if you're on the job you're on the record yep. if you work for the government you work for the people of the state of New Hampshire and we as you know the granite staters who you work for and who are footing your bill have a right to know what you're up to certainly when you're like actually doing really shady stuff right so you know that's the point is we're at the stage where yeah. it's just well i do think that people are starting to um i do think people sometimes i mean it seems like whenever any situations come up you get that i mean we saw it this morning the knee-jerk reaction well if you don't have anything to hide there's no reason to be concerned that's what the that's what uh, law enforcement or the judiciary would will say quite often. Well, if you don't have anything to hide, what are you worried about? Well, for but then Fourth on the Amendment flips, violations, right? So when the state wants to surveil us, us, they say you don't have anything. Oh, to hide. you have so nothing we, to hide. You have nothing we, to fear. Which we, is literally, by the way, a quote from, from Google's. I know, I know. It's a Nazi quote from the Minister of Propaganda. <laughs> and then, but then when you try to say the same thing back, like, well, if the government has nothing to hide, why can't we just see this? How it is? There's always. It, it, people start to hear it, I think, more, though. They start to go, well, yeah, that does seem a little strange. Well, what was interesting, you know, I've been saying that nothing to hide, nothing to fear thing that we've been hearing for such a long time as they sort of start to spy more and more on us. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's really important for folks back home to understand what's happening, right? We're at a tipping point in this country where we've sort of... Uh, the rights that we're supposed to have, right, yep. as free citizens in a free society, um, are being absorbed by this machine, the system, the government, yep. right, who are now claiming more and more rights they, for themselves. Right. They don't actually have rights. They do, the, all <laughs> the government is supposed to do is, is protect my rights. And, and and it's it's flipped around. I mean, we really it are really not has gotten... in uh, in my opinion, we are not in a free society. Not the, anymore. not as not. I don't think our founding fathers, if people would say mean, that, it, they, this is not what they envisioned. So so you know how I, I, last week I was extremely uh, upset about the the um, assault. In my opinion, although the police said it wasn't, where a police officer tackled a kid from behind in Keene. What is up in Keene? Maybe yeah, it's well, something in the water there too. But, you know, I was very upset about that. And one of my veteran friends came to me and he said, you know, one of the things that he found, like, you know, everyone has those aha moments mm -hmm. where you're like, what? So he served in, in uh, Afghanistan and he said, you know, the rules of engagement in a combat zone. So when soldiers are allowed to actually shoot, shoot right. people in a war zone are more stringent yep. than use of force that police officers are now authorized to yep. use in America against us. Let me repeat that. <laughs> you have to be more careful about shooting people in a war zone overseas than you have to be to shoot someone or 
here yes. if you are a law enforcement officer. And that to me seems like a genuinely huge, huge problem. And that is why, you know, I just keep talking about these issues because I want right. people. I want people to just think. I want people to, like you said, there's that aha moment because they sometimes you can hear the same, you know, explanations and it just doesn't get, you just don't ke- connect until you hear a story that you can relate to and you and then you say, but it's the same thing. And then you're like, oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and you never know which little piece is going to click, right? Because I think this is a really big puzzle piece, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's as, as someone who, who has been an activist for so long um, and, and is interested in the law, but in life and all these things, right? At some stage, you can holistically look at what's going on Mm -hmm. and you can kind of be like, oh, well, here's a piece of the puzzle that's taking away these rights. Here's a piece of the puzzle that's taking away these rights. And so when we get to that sort of, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear thing. As you know, I was in a lawsuit with um, the Manchester, city of Manchester Mm -hmm. on the permanent police surveillance cameras, Mm -hmm. surveillance cameras, that's the name that they have in their specs. Um, And we heard last Thursday, um, that <laughs> it was a busy was a week, cu- folks. No, but it was such a <laughs> peculiar ruling, I thought. So we heard last week that um, basically we had filed an injunction, uh, the ACLU on behalf of, of uh, me and another uh, uh, plaintiff here in the city, uh, they had divided the yep. group into different groups. Uh, so basically the, what the ruling said is, yes, uh, we... I think once you put up the cameras, they are going to inadvertently break the law by actually surveilling motorists and cars. But because that can't happen until they put up the cameras, we can't help you. So we're going to let them put up the cameras. as much as I don't really agree, but I get what they're doing, too. They're saying the cameras themselves would not be breaking the law. The individuals watching the surveillance would pr- more than likely be breaking right. the law. So I think it'll come back. Well, I mean, well in- but here's the thing, right? So when it, when, when it comes back, so my question is, and I mean this genuinely, maybe you can answer this for me. Where do we draw the lines in the sand? Because for me, one of the, the things, you know, is I was reading in today's paper and they were like, there's this vaccine registry, yep, yep. right? So it's a voluntary vaccine registry. So I'm like, I like those words. It's well, voluntary. Yep, yep, yep. It's not mandatory. Like, you know, okay, so the people who want to do it can do it. The people who don't, don't want to. But in this camera case, one of the yep. things that happened was there was testimony from the then Department of Safety's uh, Earl Sweeney. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was a lot of concern when they were passing this law in 2006 about... Um, is this going to be used to surveil us? They weren't even worried about cameras on the streets at right. that time. They were, they were worried, worried about, about cars and license plate scanners and stuff. So they weren't even anticipating this sort of big brother yep, thing yep. that we have now. And they, um, so they, they testified and they were like, oh no, this would never authorize cameras. Right. You know, if the police ever wanted to put up cameras in a downtown city in New Hampshire, they would have to go back to the legislature and get permission. Now we're saying, oh no, we could totally put up cameras. What are you complaining about, citizen? So when I look at that vaccine registry and you know the, the governor and all these people are like, don't worry about it, it's voluntary. I'm like, for how long? Right, if until we they make it this mandatory. Happen, right. And then in three years' time, They'll they're like, like oh, well, now that knows. we have the database, it's really, you know, uh, we, for, for health and safety mm-hmm. and whatever the catchphrases are, we need, to, we need to now make this mandatory. So it's like, I guess my question is like, at what stage should you be fighting these things? Because I feel like I'm, you know, I'm out there on the front well, lines. Well, I think it's and, just, I, I mean, there's only so much, like, you tend to take things more than I do in the, in the sense that you file lawsuits. It's not that I haven't ever filed lawsuits. You, you filed lawsuits. No, I know. You introduced the task um, cap. You've done some awesome But, I mean, things. I think, I always say, I think the biggest thing is just talking to people. And, you know, I was listening to somebody the other day, and they were talking about somebody else, and they said, talk, 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 talk. And how important it is that you just keep talking about stuff, whether even, like, this is a different subject matter, but this also, it's a, just talking it through because people's knee-jerk reactions to things is different than if you talk it through a little bit. I was reading in the Union Leader today that Claremont, who is responsible for the statewide property tax, just so you know, Claremont, their schools are so dysfunctional 
that last year they were like $29,000 in debt from unpaid lunches because one of their grade schools, I guess, has a pol has enough low income people that the entire school is able to have free lunch. So I don't know if they uh, built up this $29,000 in debt because they let everybody have free lunch and then something happened with the paperwork and it was re repealed from the federal government and they didn't get the funding so it was just like it's a mess and then now so then some donors stepped up and paid off twenty nine thousand dollars in school lunch debts because you're the knee jerk and my knee jerk was well kids do need lunch right oh yeah that's going to be the thing as i read the article so they're back up to thirty two thousand dollars in debt <laughs> since last year because the person responsible for filing the paperwork with the federal government to get these funds can't, can't do, it do it again. It. Can't this seem is the to do it. Time, but and then they have. The, in addition to just the, the free lunch money, they have. Um, there's a whole other federal grant, like federal education money. And I know I've talked to um, Commissioner Edelblue about this. That he said there's all sorts of money available, and you can't believe how many of these districts who are complaining that they don't have enough money simply aren't requesting the money that's due to them. And I thought. This is what's wrong with the problem. It's not that there's kids that are hungry, which, sorry, I'm going to say this and sound like the mean, awful ogre. <laughs> Parents should be feeding their kids. It's one thing if you're eligible for free and reduced lunch and you're, that's, I, we can argue whether or not it's our obligation to feed these kids. But then we're talking about people who aren't on the free and reduced lunch. How does your kid go and buy lunch and you're not paying for it and you don't know this? Well, and but there's also that sort of there's but why no does such he thing have to pay as a free right. lunch if, thing if you where you create free, the yeah. incentive? The, well, why pay for my lunch? He does those ten kids don't have to pay for lunch. So, but then the bigger problem in Claremont is not that there's kids who are or are not getting free lunch. Is that they have incompetent staff who are making very good salaries? I'm going to guess who are getting benefits, who will get pensions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Who aren't, who doing, aren't their doing their job, their job on behalf and of the you know taxpayers. What? Even though they're not doing their job, and I don't know, maybe the only way we would be able to hold them accountable is to actually know who these people are, but yeah, good luck we're not to allowed that. to do that because we don't have a right to know what the people who are working well, for us are you know, up to. On the same, and uh, not on the same note, but on a similar note, this comes to mind also, there was also an article in the paper, I think yesterday or the day before, about Manchester schools and about how we have this problem with chronic absenteeism of, with our teachers. teachers. Now, I want you all to think back to when you were in school. How often was your teacher not in class? I mean, other than this one teacher that I think had a nervous breakdown, we had a, like a constant substitute teacher. I think, um, you know, rarely was your teacher not there. Right. Well, apparently more than half of Manchester's teachers take 10 or more days sick time in a year. And I got- And routinely, all the suspiciously, they get on sick a Friday. Fridays. Right. So that made me go further because I get frustrated because people, you know, we talk about money with education. We talk about teachers. We talk about all these things. And like, okay, let, let's put the numbers on the table. T the, the teaching school year is about nine and a half months long. So for those of you who work 12 months out of the year, they don't. They work nine and a half months out of the year. So they already get almost two plus months off in the summer. That's just reality. That's part of teaching. Um, and it's a benefit of teaching. It's, and it's one okay. It's part of why that. you should want, look, yeah. well, I want to be a teacher because I can do this, 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 and I get summers off. That's, what, that's how this works. In addition to the summers off, there are 28 days out of the rest of the, the nine and a half months that the schools are not open for, because you've got all the holidays, you've got election days, you've got, you know, Christmas, they get eight days paid for Christmas, the week off in February, the week off in April. It's kind of great. So, and then so an entire month. So we're already at so we're nine and, eight and, a half, and a half eight months. Eight and a half months. Eight and a half months of the year. And then we p give them 15 paid sick days. 15 paid sick days for eight and a half months time, which is more probably like 22 sick days if you were in the in the regular world. Um, and I, it just made me say, you know, when people, when teachers say they're not being paid enough, I think, well, I don't know. You're so, so when you calculate the, the hourly rate, you should really be dividing by eight months, not right? a calendar year, right. right? So if you're saying I make X per hour, yep. it should be for the yep. eight months you work. Yep. 
Um, but you know, well, and they, if you look up, there's data. I mean, you can look the data up either on uh, the state websites or you, there's you know you can go to the census. The t t average teacher salary, and always remember that average means that there's people making a ton more and there's people making less. But the average teacher salary, if you take all thousand of our teachers in Manchester um, and you average their salaries out, they are making um, some a little bit higher than the average income hourly rate of everybody. Oh, wow. Okay. So, 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 so the what, myth of the underpaid teacher? They make it sound like, well, they're getting paid less than, well, no, they're really not. So, so I had an interesting conversation with uh, a friend whose son is a substitute math teacher in a school in Manchester. And I love getting feedback. So if people are watching mm. this and you're a teacher and you want to have a cup of coffee and just like sort of sit down and talk through what, like how you feel right. and what you think could actually improve stuff, uh, would love to hear it. But as a substitute teacher, he said he thought the number one thing that could improve public schools is to not make it mandatory. So huh. to actually allow the children who do not want to, to be, be there, there to not be there have an alternative and maybe that is where you know with the charter schools so yep. we have this 46 million dollars didn't take federal money that came in uh, that the Democrats on um, the committee uh, up at the state house with all their wisdom decided to table um, there's a lot of people that are very upset about that and there are you know we'll, we'll be making phone calls to yep. Night. Um, you know, people are writing letters and whatever. That is money that comes from the federal government that I don't like the saying it's free money yep. because it's not because we're all paying federal taxes and they're inflating away our money. Yep. But um, but it is free money in the sense that New Hampshire is a net payer yep. to the federal government. So we generally only get 70 cents of every dollar we send in back anyway. So I see it as this like, is some, of our, some of our state money state or federal away. income exactly. money that's coming back. But that $46 million could be be used and was earmarked to double the size of charter schools. So let's say in this scenario where there are these kids who literally don't want to be in school. I don't know why. Maybe they are anti-authoritarian. Maybe they didn't learn and they got promoted. Maybe and they're now bored they're because they're Maybe too they're smart. bored because they're too smart. Whatever it is, if we allow these magnet and charter schools to to step in and to create a market so that children's needs can be fulfilled. This isn't actually about the union or the teachers or who makes what. Right. This is can children read and write when they finish school? And they can't. I know. And can they think? Yeah, I was at a, I, I went to a preview of a movie, Miss, Vic, uh, Miss Virginia, which was awesome. Um, that was put on by the Institute of Justice and um, New Hampshire School choice. Uh, New Hampshire, to, uh, Kate Baker's group. Ah, the, the scholarship, scholarship fund. fund. And it was a story about a DC mom who, her son was very smart and she just couldn't get him out of the awful school that he was in. And, you know, she couldn't afford a regular school and all this stuff and how they, she went to Congress and fought and fought and fought and fought and fought. And afterwards, um, there were some students, some kids who got up and talked a little bit. And there was this one girl, her and her sister go to Trinity High School now. They used to go to Central. Um, but because of the scholarship fund, they're able to go to a different school. She, uh, just from the way she talked, you could obviously tell she was a very intelligent child. She said she was so bored and was not learning absolutely anything for her level in Central High School. She. It, there was no point in her even being there. And now that she's at Trinity, she's being challenged and she's being, you know, she's being, her mind's being taught, you know, to think. And that's what the biggest takeaway I was mean, that if, if, kids if, need to learn to think. Well, they need to learn to think. But also if we have, I don't know, 47, 100, how many kinds of cereal do we have in the world? Then maybe we, we could have more than one the, choice in education. Uh, right. You know, and I genuinely, I genuinely, you know, teachers, you need to talk to your unions. Yeah. I, you know, I've said it before on this show and I'll say it again. Go find out what your union boss is making. making. That's right. Find out what the delta, the difference between what your superintendent is making and what you're making and then maybe you need to actually start to agitate within the schools to get what you want because if you're a great teacher you're being there's a disservice is being done to you that's right okay i'm gonna change the subject all right run around time um first if anybody out there knows when the senior holiday lights bus tour is um there's i think the manchester uh, transit 
organizes a free bus tour with that the seniors all get on the bus and they drive around and there's a whole mapped out light thing. I'd love to know what it is because I'd like to tell people because I think I'm going to follow the bus this year. Oh, that would be uh, fun. Right? How fun would that be? Oh, is that like um, the dash ones? Like I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I always find out about it too late. Um, I also wanted to talk about, uh, I went to the Rex Theater with Dan last Thursday night uh, to see The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which turns out was a youth uh, Palace Youth Theater production, which oh, was fun. still fine. We just had no idea. Uh, my takeaway from the Rex was uh, parking was convenient because the parking garage was there. Uh, they had a full bar, which was with little sippy cups. Um, the seats are all folding, but they're very comfortable and they have a drink holder and everything. Uh, oh, wow. I was very pleasantly, um, like, I thought like it was normal good. size seats yes, instead Dan of was the very comfortable. old theater um, seats that are coming like mini, up, mini. <laughs> yes. Coming up in the next couple weeks, uh, I want to remind people that Saturday, December 7th is the Christmas parade on Elm Street. That starts at four o'clock. Um, and the downtown holiday market that in town Manchester organizes kicks off on uh, Thursday, December 5th. You can get more information at intownmanchester.com. Um, Courier After Hours is having uh, Artisan Night Thursday, December 5th. Um, uh, there'll be regional um, crafts being sold there and whatnot, free parking, free admission to the shop. There'll be special holiday cocktails. Um, you can get more information about that at courier.org. And don't forget that the second Saturday of the month, which is December 14th, if you live in New Hampshire, you can get into the courier free if you arrive between 10 and noon. Um, also, the Nutcracker and a Christmas Carol start, um, I think, this weekend the Nutcracker starts at the Palace and a Christmas Carol starts next week. Um, and you can get more information about things going on at the Rex Theater because I don't think they've quite tweaked their um, their website stuff yet. Uh, a Sinatra Christmas is going to be at the Rex. That'll be nice. Uh, PalaceTheater.org. Uh, two different concerts that I found information about. M New Hampshire Men's... No. New Hampshire Gay Men's Chorus will have a concert Sunday, December 15th at 4 p.m. at the Dairyfield School up on River Road. Um, you can get more information at NHGMC.com. And the Hickory Horn Devils holiday concert at Jupiter Hall, Saturday, December 7th, 7 p.m. Um, it's all country bluegrass, whatever that is. Oh, um, you can go to jupiterhallnh.com, which will bump you over to their Facebook page. So if you're not on Facebook, I'm sorry. Uh, but there's things going on. If you know about some concert or a craft fair or anything else exciting going on this holiday season that you think we should mention, send it to us at manchtalk at gmail.com and times for the bus tour. And if you're a teacher and you think you can help us better understand what's going on in our schools, we'd love to hear from you. That's all I got. All right. All righty then. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Gobble, gobble. Don't eat too much. Bye. Take care. Peace out.